share with our, our listeners, if you would, you know, about how you became disillusioned with everything that was going on and how you began to experience, if you will, a hunger and a thirst that you didn't even know you really had. Well, you know, I was at that point in my life where I had lost my husband, who was the, the love of my life, and I was, uh, I guess, trying to make up for it in a, in a lot of different ways. But the one thing I had in my life was a great passion for writing. I always, always, always wanted to be a writer. Even though that's not what I went to school for, um, I had no education in it whatsoever, um, but I just loved to do it, and it came natural to me, and I always had this feeling deep in my heart that this was what God wanted me to do. Even though I wasn't praying, I wasn't you know, mm-hmm. practicing the sacraments at all, I just had this deep, deep down inside, this is what he wanted me to do was to be a writer. And I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, and this was, had gone on for like 14 years. And I reached sort of an, uh, the nadir of my life, mm-hmm. you might want to put it that way, and that was when uh, you know, my husband left. I lost my job, and none of my books were getting published. My agent just kept rejecting them. And I decided I I started looking for something. I needed help. I just wanted somebody to help me. And nobody really supported me uh, as far as being a writer is concerned. I think they kind of thought that it was sort of like a a little, you know, it's just a hobby, Sue. Why are you taking it so seriously? Because I would spend, you know, the greater part of every weekend working on my novels. And -hmm. people would get tired of that. After a while, so you haven't published anything. When are you going to, you know, stop this? So anyway, um, I just got to the point where I needed some help, and I turned to the New Age, and I found a psychic, and this psychic would tell me everything I wanted to know. She she did my natal chart for me, which is, you know, anyone who doesn't know what that is, that's an astrological chart, and it it tells you where everything, all the constellations and all the planets were at the exact moment of your birth, and then they have designed or contrived all these different meanings as to the locations of these planets and stars and and what impact they have on your personality. So she did my natal chart for me, and she told me everything that I wanted to hear. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to end up, you're going to get married, you're going to have three children, two will be yours, one will not be, Uh, your husband's going to be very different from you, and then she proceeded to set me up with her her nephew, <laughs> which was a disastrous <laughs> trip that I took up to New York City, and, I, and, and he was going to take me on it. This is this. Oh, this only happens to me. He was going to take me on a helicopter ride over Manhattan, which should have been so romantic and so much fun. Well, the night before we left, a helicopter crashed in Manhattan, and it was oh, a geez. tourist helicopter. I thought, you know what? This is a premonition. I'm calling off this date. And I should have done it. I mean, we barely got into the Jersey Turnpike, and I wanted to get. I was trying to think of how am I going to get off out of this date. I'm going to pretend I'm sick. I have a splitting headache. Please turn around. But anyway, I went through with the date. So I was I was searching in the New Age, and I was doing the psychic thing and the astrology thing, and then somehow or another, uh, I guess it was the psychic who recommended me to me a book on uh, the prosperity gospel. Hmm. which is, you know, the one that teaches you that Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. And the reason that that you're not receiving anything is because you don't ask right or you didn't ask at all. So one night, you know, I said, I'm going to to do this. I'm going to ask Jesus. He did say that, ask and you shall receive, but I want to be sure he said that. So I'm going to go see if I have a Bible in the house. Now, this is how Hmm. far away I was from, (laughs) from anything religious at that point. I didn't even know if I had a Bible. And I, I went out, and I guess this was a signal grace of some kind for me, John. It had to be a grace to make me get up out of bed that night and go look for a Bible. And I did, and I found one. And it was mm-hmm. the first bookshelf that I looked at. And I have hundreds of books here because at the time I was writing historical fiction. So I had tons of history books in here. All those bookshelves, the very first shelf I went to, happened to be a Bible. Mm-hmm. So I got it, and I dusted it off. And I went back, and I, I looked it up, and I saw that Jesus really did say that. And I thought, wow, he really did say that. He also said, and then pick up your cross and follow me. But at the time, that part, I didn't. I was like, no, I always forget that. That's what they leave out of the prosperity gospel, by the way. And I was at that point very much inclined to do the same thing. But as I was flipping through this, I came across the Psalms of David. And, you know, how he, he says such beautiful terms you know lord you are my defender you are my strength my helper my hiding place 
And I remember reading this and thinking to myself, wow, who is this guy? Hmm. Meaning God. You know, yes. who, who is this? Because I could really use someone like this <laughs> in my life. I mean, I, I was totally selfish about it. I, I'm, I'm being honest. But I began to refer to this person that David talks to as David's God. And I became more and more bound and, and inclined toward this Bible. Hmm. And I started reading it. I started reading the Psalms. And he started getting under my skin, this David's God. And I started to pray to David's God. And you can see how the grace worked now over time, how it was, you know, moving me along and getting me into a, real, into a, a spot where I, I actually started to like him. I started to depend on him. The Bible always sat on my nightstand. I used to call it my telephone to God. I would use the concordance in the back, and whatever my mood was that night, I would look something up. Like if it would be something like, you know, irritated or annoyed or something, I would look the word up, and, and then I would read what Scripture had to say about it. And it never failed. I always read about something that was so relevant to me. And then, then something very big happened. I could see the Lord was moving me, you know, back towards this church, but I, I wasn't aware of it at the time. Now when I look back at him, I can see what he was doing. He knew he kind of had me in the heart at this point. Well, I'm at a family party one weekend, and my, my dear niece, Jessica, announces to everybody, I want Aunt Susie to be my confirmation sponsor. <laughs> and, you know, the whole room, you know, they all went, oh, the intake of breath, Aunt Susie, but she's divorced, and she hasn't been to church in 15 years, and she's the scarlet letter in the family. You know? So... I said, you know, wait a minute, guys. Let me just, there I was, the salesman, right? Let me just go to the church and see what they have to say. And they said, they're not going to give you a certificate, so you cannot be a sponsor. You're not a practicing Catholic. Well, let me just talk to the guy. So I had to find, I didn't even know where my parish was. And then I got the address, and I couldn't find it. I actually had to stop at a gas station Here. and say, do you know where St. Catherine's is? And they said, yeah, lady, it's right up the street. So anyway... I finally find the parish, and I go in, and it's Father Alex. This is how I first met Father Alex. And I sit down with him, and I said, I would like to be my niece's confirmation sponsor. And he says, okay, um, are you in good standing with the church? And I said, well, yeah, I guess so. And he kind of looked at me funny, and he said, you, you are a practicing Catholic, right? You're, you're, you keep up with the sacraments? Uh, which ones? I've got them all. So and then he said, no, 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 you, you need to be, like, going to church every Sunday. And do you do that? Well, no, I don't. But then I kind of swung into my saleswoman mode. I said, look, look, all right, how about if I wait until after after our break? Sure. You see, the, this, And then this I will tell is... them what happened. <laughs> What so happened at seasoned, that? She sees into our radio program here. As soon as we hear that music, <laughs> we know we're going to a hard break. And so, welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Janet Benkovic. Happy to be with you today. And happy, too, because Sue Brinkman is our special guest today. We're interviewing her about her new book, which is called We Need to Talk, God Speaks to a Modern Girl. As you know, Sue is our staff journalist. She writes breaking news for us and also does the research and writes our New Age blog. She does a terrific job for us here at Women of Grace, and uh, in her new book, she does a terrific job, too, of sharing with us, uh, with humor and wit and tremendous insight, the way in which our Lord led her back into union with him after she was away for ah, just short of 20 years. So, Sue, you know, when we went to the break there, you were telling us about uh, your, your niece, Jessica, announcing at a family gathering that she wanted for you to be her confirmation sponsor, but you had been away from the church for a really long time, and the whole family went into this gasp, gasp at the even, even the thought of <laughs> such a thing. But you hauled off to the church, St. Catherine of Siena, right there in Warsham, and you met up with Father Alex, and he began to have a bit of a discussion with you. Yes, he did, and he kind of let me know that because I was not in good standing with the church that I could not have this certificate. And so I went into my saleswoman mode, and I leaned across that table there, that desk that we were sitting at, and I said, I'll tell you what. If you give me that certificate, I promise you that I will go back to church. And he looked me right in the eye. He said, you promise? I do, Father. Opened the drawer, 
took out the certificate, filled it out, stamped it, and gave it to me. And wow. I remember I never even got out the door, and I started berating myself already. You dope, what did you just do? You promised a priest. You're going to go to church. You have to do it now. Because, <laughs> you know, I was a Catholic girl. I would have guilted myself to death. And I said, oh, my God, I have to do this now. I have to go. So the following Sunday morning, sure enough, the Holy Spirit prodded me. The minute I got up, reminded me, you have to go to church. And I resisted it for hour after hour that Sunday morning. I can still remember that, saying, I'm not going. I don't have to go. This is silly. So what? So what? I'm not going to church. Well, by 1230 that afternoon, I was sitting in the back of the church (laughs) in the last (laughs) pew. (laughs) <laughs> and I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, I wonder if David's God is behind this somehow. And, and, and if he is, I wonder what what does he want from me? And just as I thought that, guess what song the choir starts singing? Hosea, come back to me. Long have I waited for your coming home to me and living deeply my new life, our new life. And I got real choked up, the way I would often get when I was reading the scripture and, and feeling David's God in that scripture. And I thought to myself, that's him. That was him. He just answered me. And I thought, no, no, get a grip. You're making it up. And, you know, you know how you are at that stage. You're just sort of like, you're not really sure what's happening to you because he's so subtle and, and gentle about the way he comes into your life. He's very gentlemanly and never forces anything on you. Everything is is your own choice. You know, me, the the big pro-choicer at the time, everything was my own choice with with this God and this great God that I was falling in love with. And anyway, I that was the first of many incidences that would happen to be in church. And I did, from that point on, return to Mass every single Sunday. I went. I want to I want to stop you there, and and uh, I want to talk about a term that you used um, in the first part of the program there, uh, when you were talking with us about your return to the faith, and when the song um, Hosea was sung by the choir, and you had just asked that question of of of, of our Lord of David's God. Um, and then that song began to play, <clears throat> we would call that a signal grace. And you mentioned a signal grace earlier on that kind of began to lead you in the right direction. What do you mean by a signal grace? Well, a signal grace, you know, you know what sanctifying grace is, and that's what we get at baptism. And, and sanctifying grace, um, this is what we lost, right, when Adam and Eve fell. Mm-hmm. And... We need sanctifying grace because in order to live in the next life, it's sort of like a diver needs oxygen to live underwater. We're going to need sanctifying grace in order to exist in, our, in the supernatural, mm-hmm. you know, in the next life. So we have to have sanctifying grace, but that's not the only kind of grace. There's, all, there's also actual grace, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what the kind we receive when we get like a momentary impulse, like a, like a burst of spiritual energy, maybe to, like to pray for somebody. An actual grace can act in either a natural or a supernatural way. In a natural way, it would be, say, you have a habit of praying every day at 3 o'clock. Well, that would be actual grace acting in a natural way. But Mm -hmm. at another time, you might get a sudden inspiration to stop what you're doing and pray for somebody. Well, that would be acting in in a supernatural way, and that's referred to as an operating grace. And that's what I think I I call a signal grace, Mm -hmm. an operating grace, a grace that, that operates on you. It's very potent, um, and, and it's, it, it really it operates on you without really any effort on your part, except for your consent to it. Yes. You, know, you have to, of course, be with the Lord and be willing to, to move on, on a dime for him. Um, but that, that's what I think I mean by a signal grace, and it's a, it's a very powerful grace that makes you act in a way that you might not otherwise have done mm-hmm. without this, this power and this strength. And I think people take grace for granted. We, it's just sort of a word that we banter around all the time. It's in all of our, our songs. It's in all of our liturgies. But we don't realize that grace is a participation in the very life of God. It is the power of God which is at our disposal. All we have to do is, is turn to it and be open to it and be receptive to it. And he can do anything with that. And look what he did with me. And, and this, all of this is happening now that, that we've talked about thus far in this interview I was in a state of deep mortal sin Mm -hmm. and multiple mortal sin at that point, still committing 
mortal sins at this point in my life. And look at how powerful that grace still was. Yes. That it got me to move yes. and to act and to realize who I was talking to. And see, I think that that points out something interesting about grace. Um, sanctifying grace is the grace that we do receive through the sacraments. But sanctifying grace stays in the soul as long as we're not in mortal sin. And sanctifying grace is all about the business of conforming us to the very image and likeness of God and leading us into an ever-deepening union with him. It's his divine life at work within us. And these actual graces that you talk about are, are these, these movements of God's grace that affect us uh, in, in, the, in the natural. It's not about the kind of grace that's, that's making us into the image and likeness of God, but it's the grace that comes to lead us in the way in which we should go in a certain situation or something that we need to hear or to say. Sometimes it presents itself as those little zingers, you know, that, mm-hmm. that grab us in the soul and pull us out. And those signal graces act as signs that, that show us that God's, God's moving. And they become extremely compelling, you know. And when you got choked up when the choir was praying Hosea, I mean, that was God responding to you. And you saw that and you knew it. And there was an emotional response to that. And yet, because maybe the same fine grace wasn't there, there's this war that's going on, you know, between, (laughs) you know, I want this, but I don't want this. Do I really want this? I don't think I really want this. And this interior approach avoidance conflict, I think a psychologist would call it. (laughs) I like that, though. That's explaining things to me. I didn't understand that until you just said it. That, that, That really makes sense to me. Yes, I was at war because I did not have that sanctifying grace. I was not in a state of grace within my soul at that time. I really wasn't. I was getting there. Yeah, you were, and God, God was wooing you because He loves you so much. And he, he, I mean, He was, He was. You said He's a gentleman, and He, He is a gentleman who courts a soul, and He comes with roses and flowers, and He comes with candy, and you know, and He woos us, and He was wooing you, Sue Brinkman. <laughs> he was, but he and He knew how to lead me down the path I had to go, and I didn't realize that He was leading me, like yeah. the one mass where, where the um, the reading was Ephesians five. Now, of course, that's going to get a radical feminist very upset and that's where um, we are taught that wives are supposed to be subjected to their husbands now that is just not something acceptable to a radical feminist and i remember leaving the church that day railing at david scott the car (laughs) see this is what i don't like about you you always have to throw this in i just don't think it's fair and and why can't why can't we just be equals blah 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 so Somehow or another, he managed to get me to ask this question deeply enough that I said to myself, being an intelligent and educated woman, why don't you just read something that the church has written on this subject, Sue? And I thought, wow, that's an idea. (laughs) How about if I read a church document? And guess what one I picked up? Mularis Dignitatum. Mm -hmm. Now that one, that's the one that put the first cracks in the foundation of my feminist persona. Um, because it really had big, deep cracks in it after I read that. I had never in my life heard women being described in such exalted terms, you know, talking about this feminine genius, talking about how God entrusts human beings to us in a special way of the complementary role of, of man and woman, how he says both man and woman are human beings to an equal degree. Right? We're both created in God's image. And I thought, wow, so that's why we're equal. Up to that point, I didn't know. It was just a feminist mantra. I would just say, well, because we are, you Neanderthal, if anybody would ask me that, what, what do you mean you're equal? Well, we are. There's a very Where convincing are you argument. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, you know, and then it gets into the part about the discrimination and the abuse we suffer, which is, you know, really... Um, set upon us in Genesis 3, right, where he says, your, your desire right. shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Oh, my gosh, right. I made every, every hair on my body stand up. What do you mean rule over me? But he explains this domination in the case of disturbance um, and, and the loss of, of stability of that equality, which a man and woman possess, and that this is especially disadvantageous to the woman. And mm-hmm. I thought, yeah, you got that right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I liked what I was reading. I agreed with what I was reading. Hmm. And then the part that, that must really have startled you. It it did. Like I said it was it was kind of earth-shattering for me when I read that that document. And 
but the part of it that really got to me was the adultery story that is told in there, the commentary on the adultery that John Paul II makes. Mm-hmm. And, and he says that, um, you know, where Jesus is, is um, confronting the men who want, who want to stone the woman caught, caught in adultery. And what does Jesus do there? He actually turns the tables. He flips it on the men. And he says, you know, you among you have not sinned, throw the first stone. And what John Paul II is saying, what Jesus means there is, is he's sort of um, asking the guys, okay, here's the woman who was caught in adultery, but where's the man? She didn't do this alone. Where is he at? And then John Paul II goes on to say, isn't this episode repeated countless times in, throughout history for women? She's always left alone, exposed to you know, public disgrace over her sin, even though very often a man lurks behind that, that sin with her. Mm-hmm. But she pays the price, and she pays it all alone. Mm-hmm. And I remember putting the document down and sobbing. I just burst into tears. I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And I'm there blubbering and saying to myself, what is wrong with you? Are you cracking up? Why are you so upset? And it was because I think deep down inside, I was really ashamed of the way I was behaving, of the promiscuity um, that I was engaging in that was supposed to be feminist liberation. But I hadn't been raised that way. I was raised by good Catholic parents in a devout Catholic household. I wasn't raised that way, Johnette. And I knew deep down in my heart that what I was doing was wrong. And I felt deeply ashamed of it and deeply guilty. But for the first time, somebody was saying to you, Sue, even though you did do those sins, you didn't do it alone. Someone else was involved in that, and someone else shares some of that burden. And even though the world doesn't see it, I see it. This is the way the Lord spoke to me, and I thought, yeah, that's David's God. He would say something like that. He would be fair that way. And I felt almost as if some of the, the weight of those sins, it, it, it was lifted off of me. Not that I wasn't guilty, but I didn't, it wasn't all my fault. Mm-hmm. And I think I needed to hear that uh, in order to begin to address the fact that I really was deeply ashamed of the way I was living. And this document really started that going for me. You know, as you're speaking here, I'm thinking of the fact that um, I have a feeling that so many women who might be listening today can share the exact same emotion that you're expressing. And, um, you know, we're never happy in sin. We try to convince ourselves that we're happy in sin. And the way in which we convince ourselves that we're happy in sin is by committing more sin. It's, it's, a, it's a self-destruction that begins, I think, as, as a result of original sin. And we keep moving forward in this nonsensical, insane pursuit of happiness through the very thing that's causing us misery. And that was one of those moments, I, I would even call that a, a moment where, you know, the actual grace, if you will, was an illuminating light of the Holy Spirit that was helping you to see the misery of your condition And God in his goodness often puts us in that situation to see the misery of our condition because unless we see the misery of our condition, you know, we we see no need to break with it. And he never shows us the misery of that condition without providing us everything that we need, every spiritual blessing in the heavens to make our way out of it. And that was really a watershed moment for you in your conversion. And, I, I, you know, I think that it began to show you, yeah, David's God is trustworthy, but so is the church that David's God founded. Because look at what this this Pope is saying. He understands my misery, and he understands my travail, and he understands the weight that I've been carrying around with me. And he understood it even before I understood it, you know? That's right. And I heard David's God in the voice of the church. I heard the same voice speaking to me. I think that's really what it what it was. It was suddenly like, oh, my God, that, that's, this is David's God talking to me, and it's in a church document. Wow. And then I started to put these two together. You see how, you know, elementary my whole understanding of God was at that point. But that, that's the way it was to me in, yeah. in, in those earliest days. And he went about changing my mind in that that way, getting me to discover things on my own, um, he did that with the abortion issue with me, mm-hmm. and he also did that with the birth control pill. And mm-hmm. I, I read Humane Vitae on my own, and um, you know, reading these documents 
really changed me. And I'll tell you, I was uh, there for a while. I didn't even know who I was. Yeah. I thought, who am I? Everything I had identified with, I now knew was wrong. Yeah. And and uh, it, it was very difficult for me to put my finger on, like, who are you, Sue? Who am I now? Yeah. And then, of course, he had an answer for that because I was a writer. And all along when I said to you that I thought that it was God who who, uh, gave me that great gift of writing and that this was what I was meant to do, well, that that was true. And I had written a novel 10 years earlier. Uh, at, at the point that this book was written. And I was inspired one night to to rewrite that book. And I went looking all over the apartment for it, and sure enough, I found it, and I sat down, and I rewrote the book. And I just knew David's guy was behind it. I could just feel him. It was him. And I, I remember um, sitting down and writing it in such a way that I couldn't, I didn't even recognize my own writing. And I used to tease my mother. I used to say, Mom, I think a dead writer is writing through me because I don't even remember writing this stuff, but it's really great. And I sent it off to my agent, and my agent just loved it. She said, Sue, you finally got it. This is it. I know exactly who I'm sending this to. And a couple months later, uh, I came home from work and hit the, the button on my answering machine, and there it was, the message I had been waiting for all of my life. It was from my agent, Jerry, saying, Sue, call me right away. Harper Collins just made you an offer for your book. Hmm. And I knew right then and there it was him. Hmm. He did this. And the very first thing I did was pick up my keys. I didn't call my agent. I didn't call anybody. And I went over to the church. Wow. And I just sat in the church. And for oddly enough, the church was open that day. And it's usually not open, but I was able to walk right into the church and I just barely got through the door, and I just was sobbing and sobbing. I had never felt such gratitude in my entire life, ever. Um, in fact, to this day, if I think about that, it will make me start crying again. There's, it's, it's fathomless, the gratitude I have to him for doing that for me. That was my lifelong dream. That was everything to me, and he made that happen. And I, I told him then that day, and I say it to this day, I will love you forever for that. There's, I will never leave him because of what he did for me. I mean, but, of course, there's a lot more to this that they'll read in the book. Um, but it definitely was a tremendous moment. And then that was July 23rd, 1992, and a year later, on the exact same day, I had submitted another book to my agent, and... Exactly the same day, July 23rd, 1993, I come home from work and there's another message on my machine. And it's my agent saying, Sue, you're not going to believe this, but Harper just made you an offer for your second book, which is unprecedented because your first one's not even on the shelf yet. She said, it's a miracle. And I remember thinking to myself, you're right, it is. You don't realize that it is a miracle. And you know what? you know what reading I got that night? I laid in bed and the reading I got was from the Song of Solomon, and it was, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away, for the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come. Hmm. How beautiful. I thought, whoa, this God is for me. <laughs> wow, it's and beautiful. He, but he cleaned me up. He cleaned me up the whole way along in so gentle a way that was always my choice, um, always respected me, and let me come to him on my own terms, and it was just a, a beautiful experience. And, and I, I want everybody who reads the book, especially those who are not with the Lord, to see how good God is. Yes. And don't think you're too, you're too sinful for him. He, can, he will love you as personally as ever, in spite of all that sin. Don't let that stand between you and him. Just go to him and try, try to get to know him and try to have a real relationship with God. Mm-hmm. I want you to take us in in the last minute that we have left here. Take us to your reunion with him through the Sacrament of Reconciliation and your ultimate reception of him in the Blessed Sacrament after having been away for so long. Oh, my God. That was just such a beautiful experience. I went to confession, and everything was was forgiven. I I couldn't believe that, that I had been forgiven that much, and then I went to communion for the very first time. The, the next day, and I, I, it's almost like St. Therese. It's impossible to put in words 
what that first communion was like when I when I finally made physical contact with David Scott, hmm. this loving and beautiful God. And I remember just imagining the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and saying in my, you know, typical clumsy way, you know what, I really love you guys. <laughs> Instead of saying I really love you, God, I really love you guys. And you know what, I meant that. I really meant that I loved him. And I just cried. I was so happy. It was the happiest moment of my life up to that point. Oh, goodness, Sue. And this has been a happy moment for me to have this opportunity to uh, share with you about the book and to share your book with all of our listeners today. And, uh, you know, you've got to get the book, friends, because there's more than uh, what Sue has shared here. And it will be a delightful read, but yet a read that will stay with you. And that's what lets us know that God's about to work. And we want you to...